Aniplex Online Fest has come and gone. We didn't get any huge news regarding Swart Online in general, we just had a nice panel with the voice actors, Reiki and some other production staff here and there, but at least the release date of the movie was officially announced, so we got that going. Hey everyone, it's me GamerTurk, your best source of Swart Online information, and to cut things short, because I know most of you are only here for the most essential news, I'll talk about all of that first and hopefully you'll subscribe and leave a like before you leave as I'll go into more specifics but kind of trivial things later down the line in this video that happened within the SAO panel. Now first off, the fourth key visual that was leaked two days ago has been revealed officially along with the release date of the movie in Japan, that being October 30th, 2021. Now I will highlight this again, this is just the Japanese release date of the movie. Normally I would just say it's likely gonna be a worldwide release like Ornal Scale was, However, as you can imagine, there are things going on in the world at the moment. Covid is still causing a lot of uncertainties, so nobody around the world is currently announcing specific dates. Chances are, whichever country you're from, your licensors will pick a release date whenever things are starting to get safe in your region, so please keep following your local licensors. For the US, that is of course Aniplex USA. For the German speaking area, that is Peppermint Anime. For everything else, you just need to <laughs> search who's bringing anime movies to your country specifically. The key visual itself is absolutely gorgeous, showing Asuna, Kirito and Mito front and center in front of Aincrad and their reflections on the ground are their real world counterparts in front of what I can only imagine is Akihabara or at the very least I'm quite certain it's gonna be a real world location if anybody Japanese recognizes it please do let me know in the comments. But again it is a beautiful illustration all around, I love Mito's more casual slash sporty clothes as well, definitely worthy of a mention. Also on the key visual Mito has her scythe while Kirito has his iconic anneal blade and Asuna has the Wind Fleure that she'll be using in the later parts of the movie. It is hard to see of course, but you can clearly see the pointy portion of its handle right there. Sadly, we received no new trailer, just a small teaser with the new key visual and the release date of course, and the teaser had no footage from the movie, just like a recap teaser consisting of previous stories, just a single shot from each of the previous stories, which was the general theme of the SAO panel we had anyways, titled Past and Future, so that was understandable. With the exception of the fact that, you know, it's still disappointing expecting a trailer and not getting one. But that was the key points from the Aniplex Online Fest SAO panel, so if you're leaving now, please do leave a like and subscribe for more SAO. And now, we'll talk a bit more about the more trivial things from the entire panel, which had some nice details here and there. Kirito's and Asuna's voice actors, Yoshitsuku Matsuoka and Tomatsu Haruka were the hosts of the stream with plenty of guests, with the topics being going back to the roots and Asuna respectively. The first guest was Niwa from Aniplex and when asked about how the Arya movie came to be, he was a bit kind in my opinion, talking about how it is, you know, hard to get into a series that is so long, so making an entry movie was one of the big aspects that brought progressive movie forward to introduce people into the world of SAO. He also talked about how the visual style has evolved over time and that watching the movie will thus feel like a fresh experience. He certainly isn't wrong, like no complaints there, but being an Aniplex representative, he also does not get to talk about how they butchered their initial Ari adaptation back in episode 2 of the original anime, so everything in the movie will still feel fresh anyways because the anime never adapted the majority of Arya's story when doing episode 2. So yeah, don't, don't worry Niwa-san, I'll, I'll fill the blanks for you. Aside from that though, Mito who appears to be a great addition for Asuna's backstory is also completely original, so even us light novel fans have something completely fresh to look forward to. He also mentions this too of course, but sadly he also says they cannot reveal much about her at the moment. Niwa talks about that one of the most important aspects of the movie will be Asuna's relationship with other people including Mito as well as the feelings Mito has towards Asuna. And when I word it like that, I know horny 10 year olds will think Mito has romantic feelings for Asuna, so I feel the need to clarify here. We know from the trailers alone that Mito wants to protect Asuna at all costs, and this is the reason why she first takes her out of town right after Kayaba's announcement, and then abandons her shortly after, presumably because she realizes 
Chris's arsenal does not know anything about games in general, so trying to grind only puts her more in danger, which she does not want for Asana. I strongly recommend you check my Progressive Explained for the second trailer if you haven't done so yet for more context on that possible relationship that we saw in the trailers. Second guest was Yosuke Futami, the SAO Games producer. Not to be mistaken with individual SAO Mobile games, Yosuke Futami is strictly in charge of the console SAO games and its continuity. He talked about the very first game, Infinity Moment, which was later remade into Hollow Fragment with the addition of the Hollow Area story, but it was really funny hearing him talk about the troubles they had when they were first making it. At, at the point when they had just started developing the game, around the same time as the anime was in production, they had no character designs to work off of and had to create their own at times rather than having the benefit of having anime's production foundation helping them. It was also certainly great to hear him talk about how Asuna is indispensable to the series, especially after how much of her was cut out from War of Underworld anime how her existence brings the best of Kirito too. I wish Ono understood that too, you know? Meanwhile, Matsuoka and Tomatsu were making jokes about how in the game series Kirito constantly meets even more girls than he does in the main series. Next guest was Yoshida Hisanori from Nippon Broadcasting and one of the most interesting things he mentioned was that Matsuoka and Tomoiko Ito, the SAO anime lead for seasons 1, 2 and Ordon Scale, were the only people who were told by Reki Kawahara what Kirito said to Asuna at the end of season 1 when his lips moved without any sound being conveyed to the audience. Apparently, Matsuoka went as far as asking Reki directly, stating that he would not be able to play Kirito if he didn't know. Later, Matsuoka also talked about it and it turns out Reki just gave him one of his usual non-answers by stating, this is what I think he said, which at this point doesn't even surprise me at all. Next guest was Hidaka Rina, the voice actor of Shilika and of course, her section was just filled with cuteness all around as expected of her, but it did draw attention to a nice B-plot we had in the Oral Scale movie that many people usually overlook as to how Asuna saves Shilika and then Shilika blames herself for what happened to Asuna, some in-between scenes throughout the movie portraying this as well, and how it eventually pays off in the final fight when Asuna arrives to save and free Shilika, which Matsuoka and Tomatsu spoke a bit further too. Takagaki Ayahi, the voice actor of Lisbeth, was next, summarizing her character arc really nicely, how Kirito showed Lisbeth the real side of VR all the way back in Warmth of the Heart story, and how that character arc continues and reaches its climax when Lisbeth uses all of that to make her speech to the ALO players, talking about the line between VR and real in War of Underworld, Again, a massive character moment that has been building up for years that some people easily overlook and missing the point of warmth of the heart in the first place. One of Matsuoka's comments after this was pretty much the highlight in my opinion about how the cast of SAO made SAO into what it is today and he could not be more right. The way all these voice actors put their hearts and souls into the series so much so that some of them are simply synonymous with their roles in SAO at this point, the contribution of the voice cast cannot be overstated. Not sure if the same can be said about the English dub, but I am not sure if this is a good place to shit talk about the English dub in the first place, because that's an entirely different issue about the dubbing industry in the US rather than Sword Online specifically. The next guest was Reki himself, the author of Sword Online. He talked about the 20 year long journey since he first started writing SAO back in 2001, and about the ending scene of episode 1 as well. What struck him profoundly when picking the voice actor of Kirito and how Matsuoka brought a certain naivete and vulnerability to the vocals and of course, this all culminated in the scene where Kirito is abandoning Klein back in the town of beginnings and how much of Kirito's character and thought process Matsuoka conveys with just his voice. Coincidentally, this was one of those huge moments that got me when I was first watching the anime. The sheer amount of conflict and sadness Kirito had in his voice when abandoning Klein. Funnily enough, I had gotten into SAO after seeing criticisms about the series and I just could not believe how utterly mind-boggling some people's observations about Kirito were. Just, 
just watching this scene alone. Nowadays people talk about how a bridge Kirito has so much depth and all. Uh, well all I see is a puddle standing next to this scene alone and nothing more. Even the watered down version of the story that is the anime adaptation has so much to say about these characters that it's absolutely incredible. More from Reki, one of the interesting things was how the portrayals of these characters by their voice actors shaped them back in his writing as well. That was certainly an interesting topic to go through. It was, it was more of a constant feedback loop, different medium affecting the other mediums etc, those kinds of stuff. There is also a section where Reiki directed the question towards Matsuoka and Tomatsu where he asked how they would envision the marriage of Kirito and Asuna and upon this question the crowd went wild of course but I don't understand why, it's like nobody learned their lesson after Illustration Uniting or Illustration Awakening. If Reiki is teasing a marriage here, that means we are about to face a massive disaster in the future of Unital Ring, that is scary. And finally there were some more teases by Tomatsu as to how we'll be seeing more of Asuna's real life before Sword Online and that should give a bit more context as to why she tries out SAU in the first place apparently. Honestly, I'm hoping for a Sugo Nobuyuki cameo at the beginning of the movie, something like, you know, Asuna comes to her, you know, Asuna comes home to her parents having a meeting with Sugo about the future of the company or something like that, eventually leads into Asuna trying out SAO on release. That'd be interesting for sure and fitting as well in my opinion. But that is all from the Aniplex Online Fest SAO panel, subscribe and hit the bell icon for more in-depth SAO coverage, become a channel member to get access to a special badge and exclusive emotes to use, follow me on Twitter and Facebook for faster news, plenty of beautiful merch available on my Teespring page with special discounts available for channel members and patrons who I salute for supporting my channel directly. Until next time, stay cool.